I'll let him do the talking. Please give a warm welcome once again to Mr. Darren Wolf. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you also to everybody who worked so hard to organize this event, but especially thank all of you for coming out, standing up for such a great cause. Before I actually start my talk, I want to give a little shout out to our friends at the Brandywine Peace Community. As we speak, they are over at the Lockheed Martin property in King of Prussia, and they are protesting the wars too. They're doing what they call their Lockheedville, based on the Hoovervilles from the Depression, talking about how the war, uh, the war effort is impoverishing us. Uh, we may disagree with them a little bit, let's say, uh, on the economics, but we're basically barking up the, the, the same tree, though in different ways. Well, actually, Bob, that was a good, uh, a good uh, speaker for me to follow, because I'm actually going to touch on some very similar issues. Um, last Sunday, I was in a gun control debate over at the Ethical Society. I think uh, at least one of you was there. <laughs> um, so, of course, I took the pro-gun side. And what I'd like to do is actually give you about half of the opening statement that I gave over there, and then talk about some of the issues that I was bringing up. So here we go, the opening statement that I gave at this gun control debate. So, the fundamental issue here is self-defense. Is this a right, or is it a privilege granted to us by politicians? Is self-defense an inherent natural right, or something that the government can take away at its whim? Well, no issue can be looked at in a vacuum. Every issue, uh, we have to look at the uh, basic assumptions and the moral implications. And in this case, of course, like in any other one, that means looking at the non-aggression principle, the one moral imperative that guides us in all human relationships. The non-aggression principle, of course, is that you cannot initiate the use of force or the threat of force against peaceful people. In other words, somebody has to be actually engaging in aggression before you can use reta uh, retaliatory force. Or, of course, they have to be threatening, incredibly threatening you with aggression. And how does this relate to guns? Well, very simply, the possession of an inanimate object, here you have to use your imagination a little bit, the possession of an inanimate object aggresses against nobody. So there is no moral justification for taking guns away from people that adhere to the non-aggression principle because this would involve initiating force against them. Property rights also have their role in this equation. People have a right to their property and of course, guns are property. So if you use force to take weapons away from people, that's theft of those weapons. Now, we all agree that uh, theft is immoral, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. It makes me feel more comfortable being in this crowd. <laughs> Alright, there are times when uh, force is justified, and that would be self-defense. If um, somebody's actually aggressing against you, but they have taken your guns away, well, they've taken away your ability to use defensive force. And of course, that's just another way that gun control violates people's rights. Now, before anybody says, oh, well, that all sounds real good in theory, but just doesn't work out in the real world, uh, let's take a look at how that works out in the real world. Now, to talk about all the tyrannical governments that have killed, tortured, raped, imprisoned, uh, exiled, enslaved, and stolen from the people they've disarmed, uh, that would take much more than the two hours that we have for this whole debate. Gun control is, in reality, people control. And that starts from some very racist roots. For example, in Maryland, the law once read uh, that no Negro or other slave within this province shall be permitted to carry any gun or any other offensive weapon. In Nazi Germany, the law read, uh, Jews are prohibited from acquiring, possessing, and carrying firearms and ammunition, as well as truncheons or stabbing weapons. 
So whether it was not allowing African Americans to own guns in this country, or not allowing Jews to own guns in Nazi Germany, the intent was the same, to have disarmed victims incapable of resistance. In the bloody 20th century, Mao Zedong summed it up very well. He said, Political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Again, governments want disarmed victims. This is exactly what Mao had in mind. And there are 70 million dead Chinese to prove it. And they're only part of the 200 million people killed by governments during the 20th century. Every major genocide was done by a government that implemented some kind of gun control. This is why there's never a good time to talk about disarming the people. What we should be talking about is disarming the government. Hey, now there's some gun control I can get behind. <laughs> there's a massive imbalance between the power of the government and the power of the people. Not only the military, but the law enforcement establishment here are overwhelmingly strong. We need to start shifting that power away from the government and put it back in the hands of the people where it belongs. One of the lesser known founders, a man by the name of Tench Cox, he explained it very well. He wrote an article that appeared in the Pennsylvania Gazette, which is Ben Franklin's newspaper back in 1788. Now, picking up on the same theme as Mao, he wrote this. Who are the militia? Are they not ourselves? Is it feared then that we shall turn our arms, each man, against his own bosom? Their swords and every other terrible implement of the soldier are the birthright of an American. The unlimited power of the sword is not in the hands of either the federal or state governments, but... Right. But, where I trust in God, it will ever remain in the hands of the people. That's right. So there's only one way to guarantee our lives and liberties, and that is to be stronger than those who seek to take them. Okay, at this point I'm going to stop with the speech that I gave last Sunday, and I went on to talk about crime statistics and all of that, uh, things that uh, I'm pretty sure you guys are pretty familiar with. Let me elaborate on what I mean. The Founders warned us against having a standing army. They knew that such a force would be used to oppress us. Today, the uh, standing army we have to worry about is the law enforcement establishment. Now, I'm not talking about just the state and the local police, but I'm talking about agencies like the IRS, the FBI, the BATFE, the DEA, and ad nauseum. <laughs> This might be a good time to get you guys moving a little bit. Let's have a big boo for the agencies I just mentioned. Okay, thank you. All right. But rather than deploy troops on the street, what they do is they use law enforcement to control us. And while these agencies exist, our liberties will always be in danger. Now, in his greatest speech, and this is a speech that um, is titled, Shall Liberty or Empire Be Sought? Patrick Henry warned us about this. He was talking about the government under the Constitution. This is what he said. All right, the honorable gentleman who presides told us that to prevent abuses in our government, we will assemble a convention. We call our delegated powers and punish our servants for abusing the trust reposed in them. Oh, sir, we should have fine times indeed if to punish tyrants it were only sufficient to assemble the people. Your arms, wherewith you could defend yourselves, are gone. Did you ever read of a revolution in a nation brought about by the punishment of those in power, inflicted by those who had no power at all? You read of a riot act in a country which is called the freest in the world, where a few neighbors cannot assemble without the risk of being shot by a higher soldiery, the engines of despotism. We may see such an act in America. A standing army we shall have also to execute the execrable commands of tyranny. And how are you to punish them? Will you order them to be punished? Who shall obey these orders? He was right. Gun owners today can't stand up to the law enforcement establishment, much less the military. There's only one answer, and that is institutional change. 
shutting down these agencies while we build up the private means of defending ourselves. There's also a foreign policy aspect to this. While the U.S. government has a huge military to wield against the rest of the world, the U.S. will remain, uh, to quote Patrick Henry again, a powerful and mighty empire. A return to something like a militia-based defense is impossible while there is gun control. All too many that advocate peace also advocate civilian disarmament. And little do they know, they're actually empowering the very military that they loathe. We can guarantee peace at home and abroad only by disarming the government and arming the people. So I say, end the Fed, end gun control, and end the wars. That's right. Peace.